the Arctic is warming at faster rates than any other place in the world. The fact of the matter is that there is change in the Arctic and the historical way of managing fish stocks doesn't hold water anymore. Svalbard is in the middle of it all. As global temperatures rise, life on Earth is moving. Lizard populations in Joshua Tree National Park are shifting uphill, taking refuge from the rapidly warming desert. Baywick swans have abandoned feeding grounds in the UK to seek cooler temperatures. And warmer waters in the Arctic mean some fish are venturing farther north than they ever have before, crossing international boundaries and creating geopolitical tension as more and more countries gain legal and physical access to Arctic fisheries. A place that's seeing this change up close is Svalbard, and due to a quirk of history, it could become the epicenter of this new conflict. Svalbard is an archipelago, a group of islands uh, way up in the Arctic, around 78 degrees north, extending to about 81 degrees north. This is Dorothy Donkel, a research scientist at the University of Bergen in the Department of Biological Sciences. Svalbard is so remote that for most of human history, it was ungoverned. It was just wilderness, like the Yukon Territory. A no man's land, or terra nullius a lawless place of fur traders, whalers, coal miners, and adventurers. But all that changed in 1920. After World War I, there was a meeting in Versailles outside of Paris for the Versailles Peace Treaties. The meeting also addressed the sovereignty of Svalbard. It was in the interest of many, many countries that there just be some formality regarding Svalbard. They put together what's known as the Svalbard Treaty. There's over 30 contracting parties that have signed the Svalbard Treaty. The parties include some countries who wouldn't expect to take an interest in the Arctic, like Afghanistan, Monaco, and Venezuela, to name a few. Article 1 states, the high contracting parties undertake to recognize the full and absolute sovereignty of Norway over the archipelago of Spitsbergen. As a neutral country in World War I that already had an Arctic coastline and a culture of exploration, Norway was the perfect fit to manage Svalbard. Article 2 says, Ships and nationals of all the high contracting parties shall enjoy equally the rights of fishing and hunting in the territory specified in Article 1 and in their territorial waters. The terms of the treaty seemed fair enough, especially given what the isolated islands had to offer at the time. While the treaty divided up fishing rights equally, back then, there weren't really that many fish to catch. Not at a big industrial scale, by any means. But this is starting to change. The interpretation of the Svalbard Treaty is even more important now than it ever has been. And this is directly correlated with climate change. The main issue is the changing distribution of fish stocks. Fish stock is a scientific term for a fish population that lives in a certain area really important uh, fish stock, especially for, for Europeans, not just Norwegians, is the Northeast Atlantic mackerel. Mackerel are constantly swimming, looking for food. The plankton and small fish they eat are highly sensitive to temperature and are moving northward as the Atlantic gets warmer. When the food moves, mackerel moves, and we see really an explosion of the distribution. When mackerel used to be really just in the Norwegian and EU waters, uh, the last 10 years, mackerel has now come over to Iceland, up to Greenland, and into the Svalbard protection zone. Mackerel has a really integral part in the ecosystem of the North Atlantic, so a potential mackerel collapse could have ripple effects. In another part of the Arctic, an important stock recently did collapse. Bering Sea snow crab. The crab population around Alaska plummeted from 8 billion in 2018 to just 1 billion in 2021, leading to the first ever cancellation of the snow crab fishing season. The reasons for this staggering decline are still unknown, but warming is a strong hypothesis. This warming climate of the Arctic has very dire consequences when you have a flora and fauna that have really evolved for that climate. The ecological and economic impacts of a collapse can be catastrophic. Whether climate change, overfishing, or another problem is the main cause, fisheries regulations are key to preventing and recovering from events like the snow crab crash. How we manage the stocks is really important to understand. For any given stock, scientists make an annual estimate of how many individuals there are and recommend a quota of how many tons of them can safely be taken. 
countries with fishing rights have to divvy up that number or risk overfishing. Now that mackerel and other economically important species are in Svalbard's waters, all 46 parties of the treaty might assert legitimate legal claims to fishing rights. This puts a lot of pressure on the interpretation of the Svalbard Treaty. The heightened stakes are starting to show. In a high-profile incident in 2017, Norway arrested a Latvian ship fishing for snow crab, a recent lucrative migrant to Svalbard's waters, claiming they needed a Norwegian permit, even though Latvia is a treaty signatory. This is likely going to happen over more and more stocks. New countries are even making the strategic move of signing the treaty, like North Korea in 2016. Turkey is the latest to start the process of joining. Having more players in the game could further increase political discord. Worst case scenario on, on Svalbard perhaps would be a militarization. While the Svalbard Treaty bans military presence in the territory, tension may boil over elsewhere. Russia has often disputed fishing regulations around Svalbard, and its maritime border with Norway is a potential site for friction. Between the possibility of international conflict and the ecological threats of warming and overfishing, Svalbard is facing an uncertain future. Climate change has consequences. It has geopolitical consequences, and we need to rethink these old ways of managing as soon as possible, because I think it's going to get worse and worse. For me, it's obvious that the best path forward is through diplomacy, and that we really first and foremost understand Arctic conservation. We cannot afford to lose our Arctic ecosystems. <laughs>